started. Glenn, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen now. Um, welcome to our first ever evenings at the estuary in a virtual platform. Uh, my name is Ariel Hunter. I'm the community outreach coordinator for the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. And today we are going to be bringing you um, a partner project between both the reserve and the Elkhorn Slough Foundation. This is the first of several installments this year in our Evenings at the Estuary Lecture Series, which will all focus on community conservation action. So communities taking action to protect natural resources in their area. Uh, we will explore lots of different themes. Um, tonight, we are exploring a story of struggle and success from right here in the Elkhorn Slough itself. Um, and I will let in a moment, uh, Mark Silverstein from the foundation come on to introduce our speakers. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes for this virtual platform. This is the first time that we are going live both within Zoom and on Facebook. So if you type something or anything goes wrong, please have patience with us tonight. We will be trying our best to troubleshoot anything that comes up. If you're joining us via Zoom, we ask that you keep yourself muted. Um, we encourage you to turn off your video. We are going to be recording this for posterity. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and put them directly into the Zoom chat, uh, and we will try to answer them when we reach our Q&A period. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, go ahead and put your questions or comments or share anything in that comment feed below the video, and we will try to monitor that and answer questions from there as well. Any questions that we can't answer tonight or we can't get to you as we go late into the evening, we will try to answer throughout the week on Facebook. Um, and I believe that is about it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the reins uh, to Mark Silverstein of the Elkhorn Slough Foundation to go ahead and introduce our speakers for the night. Well, thank you, Ariel. Nice introduction and welcome everybody to the world of technology. Um, we're happy that in spite of the pandemic, we can still have these discussions and, and learn interesting things about this place we live. Uh, you know, it's really a, my pleasure to introduce Glenn Church and Kathy McKenzie, who are going to share with us their discoveries as they wrote this book on the history of proposals to build a refinery, an oil refinery, right at the mouth of Elkhorn Slough in Moss Landing. Um, Glenn and Kathy are, are longtime local residents, born and raised here in the Central Coast, Monterey Bay. They live in the Elkhorn Slough watershed, uh, so it, they are great neighbors. Um, both of them have deep roots here. Uh, Kathy was a journalist for several decades, worked at the Herald for 10 years and has worked magazines and other kinds of publishing endeavors. And so she's not a stranger to uh, this kind of work that she's going to be sharing. She and Glenn are going to be sharing. Uh, Glenn works in ag and, and uh, in business. Um, like I said, he was born and raised here. And I will share a little bit kind of this, this book is going to talk about some of the roots in the web of relations and how things move forward in a place like Monterey County. But uh, Glenn's history goes back generations in the Elkhorn Slough watershed. Uh, Glenn's father, Warren, was our county supervisor when I started working at Elkhorn Slough uh, a while ago. And in fact, his father was one of the first four founders of the Elkhorn Slough Foundation. So when Warren was on the Board of Supervisors, he worked with uh, Lou Calcagno, Don Bussey, who interestingly was the, the manager of the Kaiser Refractory, um, Hank Garcia from Wells Fargo Bank, and they incorporated the nonprofit, the Elkhorn Slough Foundation. And full circle on the story that the Elkhorn Slough Foundation has purchased land that was slated to become the refinery. And we have restored now hundreds of acres of wetlands on what might've been adjoining the refinery. So uh, I think this is a good story. 
uh, I'm going to hold up the book. Well, maybe that's too much light on it. But uh, I want to make sure that you all know that Glenn and Kathy have generously uh, offered to donate 25% of the proceeds from the sale of books tonight. And we'll, we'll give you a link uh, to the website where you can order this. Uh, but um, oh, there, I think I see Taylor, if you're on Zoom, Taylor sent a message that you want to make sure that you, uh, you, you know that you want the proceeds to go to the Oakhorn Slough Foundation. But thank you, Glenn and Kathy, for that generosity. But we want to make sure that you all have the opportunity to get your own copy. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, you know, I think when you look back at the history of places like Elkhorn Slough that have been conserved, we well, can look back on decades now of a positive trajectory. It's important to understand where that started and what it took. And so I'm just tickled to have Glenn and Kathy come and share with us what they've learned in the process of researching this, this book. So thank you, Glenn and Kathy. Thanks for joining us and, and uh, thanks for all the work you've done here. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mark. Share, we're gonna do a little share screen here then I'll let Kathy start. We have a lot of little pictures to show for people at different times. And there we go. So thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Mark. And you know, I I, I have to say that the 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 story of the SLU is such a great success story. It, it's it's just really remarkable what a treasure we have here. And um, you know, it's it's something that we can't ever take for granted. And that was one of the 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 big um, messages I think of of our book is that we always have to watch what's what's going on in our communities and and fight for what we you know what we believe in and um, so um, you know it's it's interesting how we came to to do this of course Glenn and I were in kindergarten when all of this was going on in 1965. And so, you know, I honestly have no memory at all of, of any of these events, and I never heard about it when I was growing up. Now, I do always remember seeing the, the pg e stacks, and, you know, for a long time, you would see, you know, you would see that, that line of pollution in the, in the sky above the Monterey Bay. Um, but, you know, today we, we don't see, you know, it's very rare that you, you see that brown line in the, in the atmosphere where the inversion layer, um, is, you know, is. Um, and that's because we have really great um, pollution standards and regulations that protect us. And, um, you know, and that, and, and that too is all part of, of what we discovered in the, in the writing of this book. So. Um, at any rate, with that, I will turn it over to my co-author, Glenn Church. Thanks, Kathy. And uh, thank you, Mark, and thank everybody here at the Elk Ridge Institute Foundation. Your work is just so, uh, so exceptional, so important. And, you know, the thing about, about this, uh, this humble oil controversy is that it really was a lot more than just, than just a, an oil refinery. This was really the first step one of the very first steps, and what was a plan to industrialize thousands of acres between Casterville and Moss Landing, a, a plan that would have just changed the look and face of the entire Monterey Bay area. It would have impacted tourism. It was, it would have impacted uh, agriculture, two issues that were very, very strongly argued at that time. And it's, um, you know, in, in the impact it would have had on just the natural beauty, it would have turned the Elkhorn Slough into basically an industrial waste pond. Uh, would, the, uh, would the Monterey Bay Aquarium have ever developed? It's un, kind of unlikely that you would have the aquarium and you could look out windows and look across the bay and, and see these uh, belching factories of smoke. 
would you know could this all could have very much in, you know, imperiled the um the Monterey Bay um, Marine um, National um, uh, Sanctuary there as well so you know, this the impact of all this was was far far more significant than just an oil refining and yet it also was far more than just what it would have changed to the Monterey Bay area this was an issue that um, it happened in 1965 and spilled into well into 1966. And it became actually a, a major issue in the 1966 California uh, statewide elections. You had a number of politicians from Alan Cranston to Ronald Reagan who came into the area and these issues were raised with them. So it, it, you know, it got attention from San Francisco to Los Angeles, but yet it was even bigger than that. The New York Times did several articles on this. And you start to wonder, guys, well, why? Why why would all this be going on? Why would the, you know be all this attention for you know, little Monterey Bay? Well, and that's partially because this really was one of the very first environmental battles of the modern age. And and that's what we really want to present here tonight is, is the importance of this and the significance of this. And this is also so when we look at history, we look at a lot of things as, oh, this is a what if, this could happen or that could happen. Um, but this is really something much more direct than that. This is a, um, th this is a, uh, a, a, a what was issue because Humble Oil got its permit. All it had to do was build and open the doors to industrialization, but it did not. And that's what this book is about. Um, and sadly, until we wrote this, this has been greatly forgotten um, in, in time, and yet it is a very significant story. Uh, we made a very narrow escape. So, you know, why did Kathy and I write this? Well, one of the, as, as Mark kind of, you know, alluded to, that was on the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. He had actually been elected in 1964 election, and it took office in January of 1964. The humble oil controversy came up a month later. He represented this district. And I did not learn of this whole issue until probably around 1980 when uh, I, you know, I was only five years old uh, at the time this was happening. And, and uh, there are many other issues that came up when he was on the board of supervisors we discussed, but then he brought this up to me and I became aware of it. I spent decades kind of prying into his mind, asking him things about it. And as time passed, I even asked more and more because I realized this was truly very, very significant. One of the, um, you know, my, my father passed away three years ago and going through his notes, uh, he kept many of his notes from being on, on the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. And he had this, this, this package of information about uh, three or four inches thick here of, of stuff from the, the humble controversy of four and against it. And looking through that, we started to realize uh, we, we really have something here. It's a story to be told of importance. And, and that's what kind of stirred us on into this. But I, I should say this, this whole story as we developed into it more and more was just so, so um, it's so complicated. There's so many different threads running through it. And, and then you, and you learn the, um, the very difficult positions, a lot of people, um, at least two of the politicians that were uh, my father and another supervisor were in when we were having to face decisions on this. And when we let, we're left with the question like, why did Humble leave? Nobody really knew. And I think we've, we've kind of felt we've, we've really come down to the reason for that. The other thing that we really stumbled upon, which was just fantastic, is that we found the, fir the two reporters for the Stanis California and the Monterey Herald who were the primary reporters covering this. They were friends. I was able to spend six months sending them emails back and forth, getting their input on articles they wrote. That input was just so fantastic. And so this is sort of the background of what we're starting at here. And, uh, and you know, and as I say, this is, this is really a, it, it's an issue that goes much beyond, much beyond Monterey uh, County, much beyond Monterey Bay. It, uh, and it, it really has some serious, some significant historical uh, significance. And let me see if I can uh, move my screen here. So uh, 
one of the things that that is really um you, you could really look at this issue you really got to kind of go back almost to the 1930s when the sardines were running around and um, canneries and Monterey were doing great and then you had some canneries in moss landing and and um you know this was doing really really great and it was it was it was showing that that moss landing has a potential as a you know as a really good as a good port uh, then you had in the early 1940s um, henry kaiser came in and and developed um, the um, uh, kaiser refractories next to where the old pg e uh, power plant is uh, he also developed the Natividad Quarry, which you can look out across and over by Salinas and by Fremont's Peak and see all that white rock. That was used, uh, the products from there were used in creating munitions in the World War II. And after that, World War II ended, the Kaiser then turned to making bricks. A few years after that, uh, PG&E came in. And, and, and they, in 1947, I believe, and they set up their, uh, their, their power plant. And all this time, the, uh, the Moss Landing um, Harbor uh, District was, was really starting to grow and, and it doubled its size by the 1950s. And um, um, it, was, um, it, it, was, it was looking to expand, it dredged the harbor. There was, these, I, you know, I, there was this realization that Moss Landing was a really possible economic uh, boom uh, that it could, it could bring about. And the reason is because for the very reason that is being preserved, the Monterey Bay is being preserved because of this deep submarine canyon, this exceptional submarine canyon that allows uh, from, the, um, uh, from those who are in industry and in their perspective, it, it allowed ships, these ocean going ships to come within a few hundred yards basically of, uh, of, um, of shore and where they could um, feed oil or take oil, for example, or, or you know, just to be very close in where they could um, transfer off cargo. So this is, um, all this was, was, was starting to come about in the 40s and the 50s when progress was a, was a very big, important um, um, step to go ahead. And I'll have Kathy read a little bit about her, from her book uh, about this, about what was really the key behind this whole thing, and what was really called the Moss Landing Area Development Plan. This is from chapter eight of our book. By the 1950s, the Moss Landing Harbor Commission asked the county for a master plan for the development of Moss Landing. On September 18, 1956, the Monterey County Board of Supervisors approved a massive area development plan that placed Moss Landing as the center of a new industrial economy to supplement tourists in agri tourism and agriculture. With areas zoned for industrial, recreation, residential, and commercial development, the plan promised something for everyone. It encompassed 60 square miles from Watsonville to Castroville and from the Pacific Ocean to Highway 101. The current Highway 1 was, was to be turned to a frontage road with its bridge removed. A relocated Highway 1 would run to the east, crossing over the slough approximately one and a half miles to the east of the old Highway 1 bridge and then merge into Castroville. The new bridge was 60 foot high span, so ocean going ships could navigate deep into the slough. To the east of the slough, a new major road would replace much of winding Castroville, or excuse me, Elkhorn Road. It would serve the industrial areas planned along the railroad tracks that extended from Moss Landing to Castroville. To the west, a new scenic road would hug the coast all the way to the Salinas River. Past the planned industry along the slough banks as the slough winds toward Pajaro, were plans for recreational and urban development with residential zoning to the east. To the northwest, a large recreational lagoon fed by a channel from Moss Landing Harbor and another from the mouth of the Pajaro River would extend inland about one mile. Smadowski. Smadowski Beach, sorry, I have trouble with that word. Another industrial zone was planned for the Pajaro area. The Planning Commission assured the county that the master plan was the result of a long process not hastily drawn, with ample community input and widespread support. The report stated, at the public hearings held by the commission, no opposition was expressed, indicating the results of a careful program of explaining and informing all interested groups, organizations, or individuals who are interested to the extent of taking the necessary time and effort to study the plan. 
calling for the great potential of the Moss Landing area to be realized, the report explained how it broadened its area to go much beyond Moss Landing. As the study progressed, it became increasingly evident that the study area should be enlarged to encompass a broader area, that to prepare a comprehensive long-term general plan, the impact of industrialization upon the surrounding areas should be considered, analyzed, and fit into the pattern of future overall development. And from what I can kind of gather, this picture you see in front of you is roughly where that new highway uh, one was planned to be uh, to be moved to. Uh, one of the um, interesting quotes uh, when I was researching this um, uh, that came up is um, from um, a, a general um, uh, Robert McClure, who lived in Pebble Beach, and, and in 1956, he was one of the advocates of, of pushing for this uh, uh, Moss Landing Area Development Plan. Uh, McClure, uh, interestingly enough, was actually kind of considered the uh, father of special ops of the military, but uh, you know has a definite role here because he was a, a big voice in, in helping them um, uh, push this through. Actually, the Monterey Peninsula played a very big role in, in, in pushing for this. Uh, which is really kind of interesting because you know, ten years less than ten years later, they're kind of there's a lot of people in Monterey Peninsula who are questioning, well, who ever thought of this uh, idea of putting these factories over there? Well, um, memories are short sometimes. But McClure made a very interesting um, uh, comment uh, from a standpoint of forward thinking. Moss Landing has much better facilities than Monterey for industrial expansion and would leave the peninsula free to develop its recreational facilities. And that really was, was the plan. As another person would say, Moss Landing is a place where people can go to work and the Monterey Peninsula a place for them to play. Uh, some even said that Moss Landing had a potential to be a port better than Los Angeles because of that submarine canyon. Mm. So um, this right here is actually part of the um, 1956 uh, Planning Commission uh, report that um, uh, Kathy was referring to. And, and I think, you know, the really one of the, several things I want to point out in here. One, you can kind of see down here in the map, the, um, the 60 square mile area. And yes, when it came out, people were saying it should be expanded up to 200 square miles, which would be all the area north of Salinas. Fortunately, that didn't happen. And it, and, and, it, and it had it went on from what I best I can gather about three years of discussion and development. And as Kathy also really emphasized, not a single person in Monterey County expressed opposition to it, except for two people uh, uh, concerned about the removal of the uh, current Highway One bridge, and and that was only because of the uh, the, the it would they affect their travel. So it. When I look over here on these findings, I want kind of highlight on the right, I think it's very interesting. With its expanding industrial use and its fishing boat and commercial recreational facilities, Moss Landing's future potential has been recognized. Every effort should be made to develop this potential in such a manner that will prove an economic asset, not only to the study area, but to the whole of Monterey County, as well as neighboring cities and counties. And that is something to really weigh into here because this would have just extended, the, the influence would have, would have just extended elsewhere uh, beyond the 60 square mile area. And let's see, and here is uh, an announcement of the um, 1956 plan. It's, um, uh, this is the Watsonville Registrar Peronian article or this that came out in. What I found really interesting when I discovered this is to find out and one of the highlighted uh, parts over here at the very end, uh, you see where my, my mouse is moving about, I don't know if you can see that, but it states actually that Monterey County was growing at times at 5% a year in the 1950s. That is just a phenomenal rate. And that growth put extreme economic pressure upon the county and resources. It was leading to road um, creation, new roads, paving of roads. The two dams in South Monterey County were established at that same time and so you it had property taxes rising, and this led to a lot of support in the agriculture community for bringing in some industrialization, as well as other you know, places in the, in the business community, because they were saying that, well, if we bring in some industry, it'll help re, you know, ease our burden with, uh, with this massive amount of growth. And so this was really the driving factor behind all this development. 
and I and I really have to say, after researching this, you know, we look at this now, and it's it just seems so clear cut that it's um, why why would you want to do this? Why would you want to do this? But I actually became a little more understanding of the of the of the, the pro development position once once I started to realize that the very many challenges that they were facing at that time. Here is actually a, a map of the um, Moss Landing Area Development Plan. <clears throat> this is a courtesy of the um, Elkhorn Slough, not this. Uh, the, I, it was one of the last things we put together in our book, and I was trying to find this Moss Landing Area Development Plan. And finally, I said, oh, I'm just going to send an email to Mark. And Mark says, oh, yeah, I got it. I'll get to you in a couple of days. Mark, if only I'd known it was so easy all along. <laughs> and so we got this plan, and then I've colorized it. So that's why Mark's probably looking at it and wondering, what is this? I didn't give this to him. So uh, let me kind of go over this, a um, little bit of this colorization. You can see how this blue area was actually pretty much the way it is now. This is all rural residential. And the green area is, um, is agricultural, which pretty much stands as it is now. But as you look elsewhere around here, you can see this big line here through the middle. That's the new Highway 1, but that 60-foot high bridge over there so those are going ships could come in. And over here on the brown sides, um, you see there's this little tan color next to the brown. That's basically, if you look over Pajaro and Castroville, that's basically this, the cities as they stand now. But the plan was to expand that urbanization into these deeper, deeper brown areas, which I think is where Oak Hills, uh, for example, and over here by Castroville, uh, got some impetus for development. Um, the, um, the yellow sort of agricultural, residential, like, and uh, the pink here, the pink is... Um, is recreational areas, which I always found interesting. They have the the back, uh, you know, the, the back half of the slough here is for recreational, which is going to be uh, you know, boating and and all down there. And um, you know, I can't imagine people wanting to do a lot of boating and the industrial pollutants, but you know, I guess that was the idea at the time. And here is, and you see it towards the front, Smedowski, uh, where Smedowski Beach was. There was going to be cut inland a little bit and create a big lagoon, which is going to be fed. And from um, from from uh, Watsonville and Moss Landing, as well as having some little scenic river, or excuse me, scenic road uh, along the um, the front um, of uh, along right along the coast. The red area is for industrial and heavy industry. And you know, once that really got going, who knows what would have eventually changed around. So. We have 1956, and all this is developing. And then 1965 comes along, and this is a big controversy. What happened in the meantime? Well, right off 1962, Rachel Carson comes out with Silent Spring. And it brings to life the environmental movement. The following year, Con Edison in New York State wants to build a power plant into the side of the iconic Storm King Mountain. It right. It, the, the communities there rise up, begin a 17-year legal battle. The, one of the first rulings, if not the first ruling on this legal battle, takes place in December 1965, right in the midst of the humble, the humble controversy. And there's actually a legal challenge to take in place against Humble at that time, too. So while Storm King Mountain sets, actually sets forth the environmental law, but what's going on just a year or two after that is humble. And that's why it's getting all this national attention because it's actually setting forth what really is, what has been sadly forgotten much of the early regulatory uh, law on, on, um, on developments and pollution. So let's just take a look about old humble, you know, nice little pleasant name does it. It must be a friendly little, you know, humble company um, as you would think. Well. They, uh, they were actually the major producer of petroleum products in the United States, and they were coming to California in the West Coast because they had no presence here. Back here, you had this, this old saying, they also had, besides Humble, there was Esso and Inco that were a couple of sister companies. They had the same, put a tiger in your tank that some of you might remember, and you could attach on a little tail on the, on the back of your car and drive down the road and say, hey, I've got this tiger in my tank, uh, great gasoline. I'm sure those tails blew off and littered the roads plenty. And then, um, uh, you know, just to show you the, the little scope of the times here, here's this 
no, um, February 1962, I think it is, uh, Life Magazine ads, which says over here, each day Humboldt supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. Um, they wouldn't run that anymore these days, obviously, because it just, uh, <sighs> that, that is the problem. They melted 7 million tons of glacier. And that we really clearly did not want to do well with that. So it, it just gets, gives you a gist of the times um, of how pro-industry everything was. So now let's go to February 1965. Here on the left is the uh, Slingus Californian article that shows that Humble Oil announcing it's going to come in here and kickstart this whole industrial complex that everybody's uh, been kind of waiting for for several years. Uh, you can see that dark map up there of the area, and over here is an artist's rendition of it. This is actually, Humboldt had a plan for a 50,000 barrel a day refinery, which was actually only going to be a quarter to a third of the size of what their initial plans were. Uh, interestingly, um, what they were planning to do is build, they, what they really liked about Moss Landing is that this, you know, this deep water port, they could bring in super tankers from the Middle East and then have a submarine pipeline just go out about a half mile or a mile out there and suck that oil in and then send it back out. And plus they had PG&E, which was right next to them. And they're thinking, boy, these guys got to need fuel too. This is a ready customer. But you'll notice it's really interesting. If you look at PG&E up here, where are those two big smokestacks? Well, the smokestacks weren't built at, the, at this time. But what was really, really interesting and pg e did not do humble oil any favors on it, is that those two smokestacks that we look out there and we see all the time, and I know as a kid growing up, I was thinking, boy, those things are ugly, but those two smokestacks were being constructed just as all of this controversy was coming to a head in August and September of 65. So people from Santa Cruz to Monterey could sit there and look and see these these, these smokestacks slowly creeping up into the into the air. And as as a kid, I, re, I was only five years old. I remember sitting staying outside my um, um, or at, at the living room window with my mother and 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 making a mention to her about, oh, it looks they've they've, they've increased these up a, a lot here in the last whatever it was week or so. Um, so that's the only memory I have of this whole thing. But but the but the, those stacks now, I look at those. And I actually have a fondness to them because they're they're like a, a a memorial to what really could have happened to us, and it's something that that we should all kind of look at and realize just how close we came to to losing so much. And what, the other interesting thing is that PG&E at this very time was planning right across the road here of putting in a nuclear power plant. Actually, they had plans to maybe throw in. Th three altogether, three nuclear power plants altogether. But uh, the Board of Supervisors in the summer of 1965, while they're dealing with Humboldt Oil, actually went up to Humboldt County and, uh, and you know, in, in Northern California, where PG&E had one of the um, nuclear power plants uh, uh, that it wanted to use as a, a model to develop down here. Fortunately, that never came about either. And uh, let me see here. Uh, what's really interesting at this time is that Monterey County had basically no pollution loss. It, it had, a, had a little bit on dust and smoke, but nothing really with um, emissions of any significance. And so Humble comes in and they're saying they have these they're saying these crazy things like, uh, well, besides just saying, oh, we can meet your uh, your conditions, no problem at all. Well, there are no conditions uh, that we're going to you know, need it on, 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 the, on the pollution controls of the county. But they're saying crazy things like saying, oh, the water we discharge at the ocean is cleaner than nature's own. And uh, you'll never worry about our emissions because they're undetectable. Uh, they made that statement very early on, those two statements. But then I think they were thinking they were coming to some kind of Cow County, uh, where people were kind of ignorant, and that quickly changed over time uh, as they realized there was a lot more sophistication going on here. So just how much support did Humble have? This is what's really, really interesting. We look now and we say, how could anybody put, agree with this? You look at these numbers. 
Monterey County supported the building of the humble facility greater than two to one. Look at North Monterey County. This is a humble survey. And yeah, I, you might say humble survey shouldn't, you know, can we really trust it? Well, um, my father, Warren Church, actually did a, uh, his own survey, not truly a scientific survey uh, around the same time. And his numbers for North County matched this kind of stuff. 82% of the people were in favor of it. In Salinas, 75% of the people were in favor of it. Uh, South County had another strong support. Seaside was a little more divided, but still in favor of it. Only in the Monterey Peninsula was there opposition. So this is, um, you know, you gotta keep this in, in mind that the will to build this was there politically. And when you have this kind of strong will, politicians do not vote against it. So let me just uh, kind of go here to um, break down our, our, our timeline. Um, I'm gonna break uh, this whole controversy into four particular areas. The first one is really what comes up the planning commission. And it would, you know, there's a lot of meetings that were going on. Humble was, was uh, bringing in people. Opposition was bringing in people. There were experts, they were arguing back and forth. It, um, in, and the, the, the planning commission would end up voting surprisingly it was expected to, to pass this initially, and then it became a closer vote. And then surprisingly voted five to four to turn down Humble Oil. The person who shifted his vote was a uh, hardware store owner in Salinas named Peter Kailoto, Kailoto. And he was initially in favor of this, voted against it, and suffered tremendously because he went against this overwhelming support what was going on in Salinas. His hardware store was, uh, he lost customers. Yeah, people canceled their accounts. Uh, it, it, his his action was truly heroic, and he, uh, he and he would suffer from it for years on. Over in um, uh, and that that's significant the way, and I think it really really set a stand, uh, set an example of for the board of supervisors realizing just how 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 weak of a position they were if they were going to be voting against a, a majority of their district. But there's another commissioner out in the Elkhorn area, Daniel Christian, who, who was in favor of Humble Oil, but said it needed to be strictly controlled. And he advocated for those strict conditions. And that opened up another path, which would play a really important role in this. So I'm gonna have Kathy read a little bit about, uh, no, is this where, uh, yeah. I'll have Kathy read a little bit about this as, um, as, as we're, we're going up. About um, um, about the um, um, uh, the inst uh, what's going uh, not with the planning commission, but the, the um, about the environmental right. Okay, yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry. We just had to get that <laughs> figured out. Um, so, so this is from chapter seven, and <clears throat> um. There was widespread acceptance from all sides that the Monterey Bay area was something special and deserved all due protection. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, had only been published a few years earlier in 1962. The environmental movement was stirring to life. The people of the Monterey Bay were at its forefront. Unwittingly, Humble had become a catalyst for the environmental movement in the region and one of the first local uprisings of the national environmental movement now taking shape. Whether or not a refinery was built, the controversy had unleashed a new awareness, a juggernaut for conservation that could never again be denied. For the first time since industrial zoning came to Moss Landing, people were beginning to question its appropriateness. One oil refinery can't make much difference. But one begets a second, and a third is, is the symbol of heavy industry generally, of more cars, more people, more dust, more gas, more smoke. In short, of the upward creeping, stinking concentration of smog, wrote C.D. Wheelock of Carmel in a letter to the editor. The basic concern here is the zoning of great areas around Moss Landing for heavy industry and a deep water port. The strong support that existed after World War II for an industrial park in Moss Landing was losing its appeal. PG&E and Kaiser refractories crept in, but a, but a foreboding feeling was growing. 
Those who felt that Humble would destroy the environment on its own were very few. When Humble officials said it would, would not do that, they were correct. This was especially so for a 50,000 barrel refinery, quite small by industry standards. What else would come? More refineries? Other heavy industries belching smoke and fumes? Monterey County had finally entered a debate on the appropriateness of, industri of industrialization in one of its most environmentally sensitive areas. So here we'll um, move on and look at a, a little bit of Humble's PR efforts. Um, they put out these different, a couple different newspaper ads. And as I say, they were out meeting to rotary clubs, newspapers, everywhere else. They, they had this one ad over here where they had this little fish called Yvette. I have a hunch they probably had a lot of Yvettes. And it was a goldfish that supposedly was swimming around kind of like a canary in a coal mine. And as long as uh, Yvette was happy, but then... I guess the water was supposed to be clear and that was part of their whole, um, that, that they were just such a, a good neighbor and not gonna pollute anything. But one of the big issues that really came up early on, and this is um, one of the, uh, the notes I was able to gather from my father's files. And you can see in the background, these blue papers, these blue papers are put out by a major opposition group based on the Monterey Peninsula called Citizens for Clean Air. And they, uh, they presented 10 of these memorandums um, about all the problems that could come about to the Board of Supervisors before uh, a September 2nd uh, meeting, which was the, the first big meeting uh, uh, for the, uh, in the county on this after the Planning Commission, that is, but it was uh, even bigger than that, of course, than the Planning Commission meeting. And so what there, there were, one of the big concerns was that, that you put in a, an oil refinery and it brings in satellite industries. Here, this is up, well, up, in the, um, up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and you can see the black dots or the black squares as oil refiners. There are five of them up there. And then you see the satellite industries that come in. The, here, there's 21 petroleum byproducts ones, which are in the blue. Another 33 add in chemicals. So you could see humble oil coming in would immediately draw in companies that want to build fertilizers, uh, plastics, asphalt. And so it just, it just, it shows you that that it really, the, the issue wasn't humble and 50,000 barrels a day. It was what's going to happen after that. So um, the second timeline on to here really covers this, this very critical period after the Planning Commission to September 24, 1965. And uh, this is right before the, um, the Board of Supervisors were to, to make a vote on this. Uh, nobody knew really exactly how it was going to come down. It was, um, it was kind of viewed as a 2-2 split at that point from what they had gathered. And uh, and so you had these, these are the five, the five supervisors that were, um, that were involved in, into here uh, uh, that were making a decision. You had um, uh, Harold Henry, who was probably the strongest advocate. Of, he was representing South Monterey County. He was, um, uh, jumped on board very early on when agriculture was generally in favor. Agriculture then started to turn against it, and, and Henry was caught in a real vice, but he stayed supportive of it. Arthur Adderidge, who was in Salinas, again, you had like 75, 80% of people supporting it there. Adderidge had played a big role in bringing some industry there, but he was uh, also a Democrat and, and, envir and environmentally minded uh, for the time. Uh, he, um, you know, did a you know, really developed cleaning up into a modern city. It is today a lot of a lot of things he did. Then you had this uh, uh, other fellow in here, Buford Andy Anderson. Anderson is a um, um, very pivotal character in this. His district had just been created in the Monterey Peninsula. Prior to that, Monterey Peninsula was just one super zero district, and the previous one prior to that was just very south of Monterey County in the San Ardo area. It was only had a few hundred voters. And, and Anderson was a man of tremendous courage. Here you see he's getting the Congressional Medal of Honor from Harry Truman, which he got um, um, what he earned in Okinawa, and he was also uh, had the Bronze Star in the Philippines. He was the only supervisor who voted against the wishes of his constituents, and four of those five super zero districts were in favor of it. Um, then you have Warren Church, who had the, it was in his district, the district was overwhelmingly in favor of it, and 
took undoubtedly the, the strongest role in, in part of all this. And he and Adderich played a very interesting um, situation as they both would end up voting for this, but they would be the ones who would be really driving the, uh, the setting the conditions for Humble. And then you had Tom Hudson over here who was adamantly against this thing, played probably the most critical role, um, really played, uh, we don't know what he all did, but probably the most flamboyant politician the county ever had and was, um, was definitely against Humble. So here, uh, this is September, and there were two board meetings. The first one here with the red lettering, September 2nd, Humble gets its approval in principle on a 3-2 vote. That meeting went from 10 a.m. in the morning till 3, 3 a.m. the next morning, 17 hours long, with a few breaks, of course. Longest meeting in, in, um, in county history, uh, bitter fight. To, but they say, we will uh, we'll set the conditions in two weeks later. Two weeks later, Humble gets its, its permit. 3-2 vote. Again, the same thing. Key to look at up here is where it says, curbs on refinery total 39. And right in this time, a lot of things are going on. Uh, between these this, this two-week period, the Monterey Peninsula rises up, puts together a referendum, grabs over 12,000 signatures, and... Um, and and um, and and just a five and a half day period, I think it was the um, the signal. You know, the, the referendum attempt is thrown out, being viewed illegal. So uh, uh, Bill Burley, who would later become a judge in the county, takes uh, uh, legal action and goes on for the duration of the next nine months plus, uh, fighting and challenging um, uh, humble oil, losing but nipping away at their heels, constantly playing a very big role. And, uh, and then you had these, these conditions, which Humble at that time walks out of this meeting calling them the strictest in the world. And so all these, you know, at this point, Humble has its permit, but actually its own demise is, is, is being prepared at this point. So we go to this, this um, part three in here, and there's just, you know, this referendum uh, and lawsuits are going forth. Uh, Monterey County is then establishes uh, a smog um, air pollution control district, the first one in the county that is uh, in the state that is established before air pollution is determined to be a problem, uh, which was really a very historic uh, um, action in itself at that time. There's Tom Hudson doing things behind the scenes that are just some kind of crazy things, and we don't know how it all came out and into into play, but it's it's uh, it's very significant in, into there. And eventually, uh, you get around to May of, um, of 1966, and, um, and Humble Oil announces it's, uh, it's pulling out. It basically, basically is, is pretty much set in stone on March 30th, when a number of things come around, including one of the things that, that played a big role in this, besides Burley, continually to harass uh, Humble. And the, the groups, of uh, the people who had been um, Citizens for Clean Air, they had changed their name, but they, they were continuing trying to get national attention onto this. They were continuing to, to oppose Humble um, in every way they could. But Humble also had decided over this winter that you know, a 50,000 barrel a day refinery isn't just going to, um, isn't, isn't just going to cut it. Uh, we need a bigger one. There was one problem. One of those 39 conditions in there said, if Humble Oil wants to expand beyond 65,000 barrels, it was gonna to need to have to come back and get a new permit and start this whole thing over again. So here we're, you know, at the end, uh, there's the, the Watsonville Register Paronian came out with a really interesting, oh yeah, uh, a re re really interesting um, uh, uh, editorial at the very end and, uh, I, I think it's really appropriate for for here for the Elkhorn Sloop Foundation. So Kathy's going to read from that. Yeah, it actually was published the day after Humble announced it was pulling out. So um, the opponents, to be sure, were most vocal on the Monterey Peninsula at a considerable distance from Moss Landing. If the refinery should be overly smelly, it hardly could have offended the the nostrils of the denizens of Pebble Beach. 
if it should pollute the air, the damage would be to the Salinas and Pomero Valleys and not to the 16th Green at Cypress Point. Only water pollution, if it should occur from spillage from tankers, would have been a direct hazard to the people who made the most noise. These people, however, may well have done a favor for the people of the Salinas and Pajaro Valleys, sometimes referred to as the last remaining clean air shed in coastal California from the standpoint of smog. At the very least, they caused the creation of air pollution control machinery. Further, they and some of the people engaged in agriculture hereabouts have alerted us all to the care we must use in giving use permits to industries. Moss Landing is designated on Monterey County's master plan as a site for heavy industry. It is a proper site for such use with rail and highway connections and a port. Pacific Gas and Electric and Kaiser are already located there and it would be folly for conservationists, however well-intentioned, to contend that Elkhorn Slough should be maintained as a permanent bird refuge. But as Humble's opponents pointed out, there is something special about oil refineries. They can't help smelling like refineries and only with the greatest care can they be designed to avoid putting pollutants into the air and spilling crude oil into the water. Clean air, uh, excuse, excuse me, clean water is essential to the recreational functions of the Monterey Bay area. Clean air is vital to agriculture, our basic industry. And so that basically brings us to the end. Where did Humble go? It went to Benicia, which Benicia was desperately in need of some industry um, because an, a, um, an armory up there had just closed. It was falling apart. Benicia put zero conditions on Humble. And um, when you go and you, um, you, you can still buy gasoline from, I'm sure, some of the, um, some of the remnants of the old, um, of the Humble um, refinery because now it is, uh, it's on the other side of the Cartagena's Bridge. It's owned by Valero. So I think from our perspective, it's worked out well for everybody. Benicia got what it needed. We got what we needed. And nobody ever, ever again came in here to, um, to really do this, um, uh, try to do industry uh, industrial development and that brings uh, to an end to our um, our, um, our presentation so uh, so now we can um, take some questions take some questions from anybody who's interested no, that uh, thank you guys that's a it really is an extraordinary story and you realize you know how close I mean they had approval yeah and a combination of the conditions, but also the local people saying, not here, this isn't going to happen here. And it was a battle. I mean, what, what struck me in your story is, is how long and persistent the community had to be to get their voices heard. But ultimately, they were. So and I think this is, this is a great, uh, really a great story. Um, now, here are here's a question from someone in the audience coming through Ariel, and so the question is, who were the in quotes heroes who came to the forefront of this story? Who do we thank? Who do we have to thank for this outcome? Wow, there's, there's so many. Uh, it's um, it, you know, it, Tom Hudson. I, I think had the biggest role to play in all this. And, and Tom Hudson was a real complicated individual. I mean, when, when you really you really look at this whole story, uh, there's uh, the people on Monterey Peninsula uh, from the Pebble Beach area that started initially, a fellow named Charles Kramer, um, uh, what's Earl Moser, and, um, and Gus Bauman, who started the uh, Concerned Citizens or uh, Citizens for Clean Air. What's interesting about these three is that. Bauman's a retired industrialist. Um, uh, Kramer is a retired industrialist. Moser's a retired oil executive from Chevron. These guys have put these factories up all over the country during their careers. And here they're going through, and now you know they're standing up for it. But they also had contacts. Uh, another uh, big hero in this whole thing, I would have to say, would be, uh, would be Fred Barr, who was um, Sam Barr's father, his state senator at the time. He helped push through legislation that allowed the creation of this, uh, uh, the um, um, uh, a smog uh, or air pollution control district. 
So you had all this opposition on the Monterey Peninsula, but you had um, another fellow, um, uh, a, a agriculture was really turned by the, by one fellow named Dave Williams, who worked for um, Bruce Church Incorporated. And uh, one thing you find out in this book is that the name Church pops up about four different times. None of the people are related. <laughs> it's really a trip must have really confused people back then. But Dave Williams uh, turned the tide so that agriculture then became very split. Uh, the um, uh, grower shipper who took a neutral position, the Farm Bureau opposed it. That was really critical onto there. But I think you also have to really look down at, um, as well as uh, Bill Burley. You know, his, his just, he, he was failing on every one of his lawsuits, but he was very creative. And then the judge called him creative. And, and it just, with, with this whole thing with Storm King Mountain still going on, I'm sure Humble had to be looking and saying, we got to fight this guy for how long? Even if he doesn't have, he's not going to win, he's still nipping at her heels. And, and then the other thing you got to look at is, is these people that were kind of in the middle that were trying to, you know, handle things politically as, as well as some of the supporters, because even the ag supporters that were really behind, uh, behind Humble, they wanted strict controls. They, they were saying, we got to have strict controls on this. And so, so when this was all approved, there was support for these controls. And from you know, Arthur Adderidge or, or my father, who really, you know, really pushed onto those. And I think they, they saw what Peter Christian and the Planning Commission was doing. So, the, so what's really, really interesting is that it, it wasn't just the opposition. Um, and, and you got to say, like, say the opposition, when it came to the controls, the opposition kind of dropped out of the way. It was the people who were like Dave Williams and some of the ag people, and then the, the, some of the members of the board of supervisors who, who really uh, who said, okay, we've, we've approved this, let's put some really tight clamps on. And so you got all these factors coming into play there. And I don't know if any single one is more important than another, but that's kind of the heroes. And in this, in this book, as one of our readers said, reads kind of like a Russian novel with characters coming in and out and <laughs> and uh, you know it, it's you know it's and, and that's really true there's just so many people that are heroes yeah I think that's one of the things that's interesting in my reading of it you develop you develop these people as characters right you sort of describe their trajectory and and uh, some of their motivations and I just found that fascinating I think you this Another question came in. I think you really kind of tackled it in the last, which is, was there a defining moment when the tide turned on this case? And what was it? So you talked about that. You talked about Burley and, and some of the other players. Uh, I mean, any other thoughts on, on uh, the turning of the tide beyond yeah. what you described? Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Mark. Um, my, M March 30th was sort of, I think, the public, uh, because actually the word came out at that point that Humble was going to pull out, and then they backed off. 1966. Uh, 1966. Yeah. yeah, yeah. March 30th, 1966. Humble's announced they were going to pull. Their word came out they were going to pull out, and the next day they they backed off. But six weeks later, they announced they were coming. I mean, that's sort of the official part. I, but as I said, I think in that 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 September 24th board meeting where the referendum was discussed. It led to the, the lawsuit, the conditions were going to be created. I, that really just set the germ for this. What's interesting is that two weeks after they get their permit, Humble's up in, um, up in Martinez looking around for other possibilities. But everybody's still at that point thinking they're going to build. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. I mean, people can, can through the... Uh, chat box on Zoom, or I think that there's a mechanism through Facebook if you have questions, or if you, uh, if you wanna raise your hand or unmute yourself, uh, let us know. Um, but I, uh, you know, I think what, in the, in the history of your researching this and the time you did this, I mean, I think it was fascinating for the reason that your father was one of the players in the whole scene, and so I think, that must have given it a whole nother dimension uh, for you, Clan, as you were research this. And, uh, um, you know, it was just quite fascinating. Well, yeah, yeah, it, um, it, it really, it kind of was. It, um, 
I mean, there's a lot of things and his, his positions he took, I didn't realize about. And then I, the other advantage I had is I actually had is my dad just kept notes on everything. And he had his, um, he, he had his notes from a 1964, um, super campaign. And, and what was really interesting then is he defeated, uh, the incumbent. That incumbent was actually the architect, one of the architects of the Moss Landing Area Development Plan. who had, He'd been in office since uh, 52. And he had been you know, strongly pushing forth for this. In his campaign literature, I had copies of that. He was you know, you know, talking about, hey, we're going to get the highway moved. We're going to get all this going here. And so uh, if he would have been reelected, you wouldn't have had these conditions. I know that. And that would have been one big change onto there. Um, it's so, you know, but the other thing was really kind of interesting. And I, I realized, you know, and this is why I really wish I would have had a chance to really talk to him about this. He probably forgot about this is that, is that one of the campaign positions he took, he said, Hey, if there's controversial issues, I'm going to send out a survey and I'm going to go with the will of the majority. So he kind of boxed himself in on this. He had no choice, but to support it. Initially, he would have been recalled with 80% of the people. And he, and as he told me one shortly before the end of his life, he says, you know, he was already in a weakened position because zoning laws were just coming in and people were really up in arms about that. So, uh, yeah, it was well, definitely, definitely interesting. You know, we have another question. And, and before, before I uh, ask you this question, you know, I just want to remind folks, I mean, if folks, some folks may need to sign off in a bit, but take this, check this out. Uh, please order this uh, through the links that we provided and uh, you'll be supporting this great research and also the continued conservation of Elkhorn Slough. But here's a question. Uh, did any scientist at Hopkins Marine Station get involved? And I would, I guess, expand that with, if there was any other uh, uh, science folks on the science side that weighed in on this. There wasn't recall. anyone from, from Hopkins that we, um, that we knew of. However, there were a number of university uh, researchers and professors who came here and um, had uh, meetings with, with people. Um, there were a few from, uh, from Southern California who were, you know, at the forefront of uh, pollution research at that time. A guy in particular from uh, UC Riverside um, um, oh, it's just hopping in my mind. Yeah. Um, uh, Darling, was it? No, somebody else. Anyway, okay. there were there were a bunch of them, yeah. but um, but it was quite interesting. So one of the the things that that I was kind of fascinated by when when researching this was how much interest there was in air pollution and and how afraid people were of it, because. Here, you know, people could could see what had happened to LA. You know, pollute air pollution from automobiles had basically wiped out agriculture in that region. It just absolutely decimated it because it was a big agricultural area up until the the 30s, and um, and so people here in agriculture saw that and they said, oh my gosh, we do not want to wind up like LA, you know? Um, so uh, anyway, but, but getting back to the question. So yes, there were, um, now um, the other thing too is a lot of people in Pacific Grove in particular were very involved in um, the, um, like the referendum movement, gathering signatures, making phone calls, um, a lot of people who, you know, we couldn't find out much about because they just, you know, nobody wrote newspaper articles about what they were doing. But there had to be a very dedicated group of, of people, um, you know, in the grassroots type movement to, to try to, to block humble. Mm. And before, uh, before you began this evening, we chatted briefly about uh, Ruth Andresen, uh, yes. who really was a champion, just celebrated her 100th birthday in Salinas. Uh, but she had been a student at Hopkins mm -hmm. Marine Station in 1939. Right. And then subsequently, right. yeah. after she raised her kids, uh, she was at Moss Landing Marine Labs and became one of the first people on the regional 
Coastal Commission, and I know that she, mm-hmm. uh, you've talked with her and you know her well, and she, uh, she championed this as well. I mean, here's another question that's come in, um, and it says, how do they, uh, ESF, ES, NERR, whoever, currently monitor existing pollutants, like from agriculture and dairy? And so I don't know if you want to tackle that or that's something that maybe I could answer. You, you should probably um, should answer that one. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, again, some of the downstream legacy of that win and what you've written about, the fact that this did not become the industrial hub that was envisioned, it went in a different direction. And the direction was to invest a lot in the conservation and management and understanding of Elkhorn Slough. And it is now one of 30 National Estuarine Research Reserves. And so a core part of the function of the National Estuarine Research Reserves is to do exactly what this question asks, which is to monitor the environmental conditions. And so we have a a water quality monitoring program, uh, sort of two modes, but it was established in 1989, 1988, 89. So a 30 plus year data record. And so we're monitoring a number of constituents in the water, both monthly and at four stations every 15 minutes. And so we have uh, been able to identify sources, particularly of nutrients coming into the Elkhorn Slough. And um, and I think that that I feel I feel lucky and grateful for the people that you wrote about that we can tackle nutrients coming into the slough from agricultural operations instead of oil and uh, all of the hydrocarbons that might have come had there been a refinery there. Um, so that's a good question. Now let's see if there's other any other questions that have come in. Here's another you, you, one. You probably wouldn't be here, Mark, if that refinery was there. <laughs> You'd be somewhere uh, else in the uh, world. I, I might have been. Hopefully I wouldn't have been an oil man, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Here's, here's another question. Um, I am wondering about the involvement of Bill and Dorothy Carney, who published the Castroville Times. Bill Carney is mentioned on page 153, challenging humble on water use. Was the Castroville Times an important newspaper for information and debate on the humble and development issues? Good question. Oh, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Actually, you see, that, that's surprisingly enough, the air pollution was such a big issue going on there and an effect on tourism. And that I, I really feel water was shortchanged in this whole debate when I'm looking through it. Carney drew that out. He really drew that out. And he really, you know, Humble was making this claim saying, uh, you know, we're not going to use any more than uh, water than, than, than the farmers are using over here. Well, you know, the farmers are only irrigating, whatever, eight months a year, 12 hours a day. Humble was going to be running 24 hours a day and for all year long. And it's and you know, and then and Carney would, was drawn out saying, Oh, yeah, they don't use any more water than agriculture when agriculture is using it. But if you look at the total, it was just it was just a, a sly attempt by Humble to run it through. And Carney was played a, a was you know really drew that out in a you know better it was wasn't raised anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And um I, I just when I when I stumbled you know stumbled on that thing, it was uh, it was really helpful and 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 fortunately that was one of those articles that my dad had kept uh, because uh, the Castrol Times is kind of hard to, to I'm sure somebody's got it around but uh, it was you know it, he had that it was an article it was right clear there and um, and uh, and yeah you know I I remember meeting Bill Carney a few times and. Uh, uh, really was um, sad, and I think it was in the mid '70s when the when the Castrol Times went out. It was uh, yeah. it was a great paper. Well, you know, Dorothy Dorothy Carney was uh, uh, like one of our cherished volunteers at Elkhorn Slough for many many years, mm-hmm. and she established the library here, the volunteer library at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. And so she, I I think of her fondly. She was really an inspiration. So that's a good link. Uh, here's yeah. another question. Um, did the opening of the harbor mouth coincide with the refinery plans? Well, it was part of the thing that came up to it. Um, 
it, it really, the, the opening of the, the, the harbor is dredged in 46. And, and uh, so, you know, this didn't really start 56, but it was all part of the, it's part of the, the sort of the, the pre-development of it all. And uh, it, it definitely, you know, it had an effect. I mean, that, and that, I got to say, is part of the thing that kind of drew me in, probably led me to help draw this out, because see, my, is, my, my family on my, my, my maternal to my maternal side has been all along the slough here. And at the, um, at the very end of the slough, my maternal grandmother, uh, at the end of Hudson Landing Road, or, you know, my grandparents, Arnold and Nita Wells, they had, their, um, they had a house there. And my grandmother, I remember growing up in the, in the 70s, just constantly complaining about how the salt water was coming in. And she said, this wasn't a problem until the slough was dredged. And, and, uh, and, you know, and so it was, it was coming in. She was constantly complaining about that. But, um, and so that kind of is one of those things that, that is in my mind about, well, what is really going on here? And uh, so I think it was is helpful in, 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 the, in stimulating some of this uh, interest in writing the book. But yeah, the, uh, the dredging of the slough was definitely a very big thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is fascinating. I think the thing that's always struck me about Elkhorn Slough is that, you know, it's a, it's a size that you can get your arms around, but it has all the complexity of much larger systems. You know, there's a rich, rich ecosystems and the natural environment. There's farming, residential development, industry. It's all happening at the slough. And so as a place where you can look at how, um, how these various factors and now what you've revealed with your book, you know, how the kinds of decision makings and political system intersects with the history and the trajectory of places like this. I just, I find it very fascinating. So I, I really thank you and appreciate uh, what you've done. Um, I'm seeing if there, we have any further questions from either Zoom or Facebook. I'm, I'm looking to Ariel and um, it doesn't look like we have any more um, coming up. If anyone, here's another question. There you go. Um, well, someone asked if the, uh, if the, all the incredible photos that you shared, are they in the book as well? And I think a lot of the photos are, uh, you do have reproduced in the book. Yeah. I mean, it, the, um, uh, you know, of course they're in black and white, um, onto there, but I think, uh, yeah, everything is pretty much in, inside the book. Yeah. Uh, of course you can go to our website, which has, uh, has, you know, some color and colorized version, like. This this great one of the uh, the artist rendition that Humble had of that uh, of that refinery is is on our web. Oh, that's a great, really uh, really impressive. We uh, we really I really wanted to have that colorized, but for the book, but you know you, you got to worry about the cost sometimes. Yeah. Well, listen, I I uh, really just want to thank you, both of you, for sharing this research and this great book with us. Um, and I will turn this back over. Is there a question here? Let's see. Somebody's coming online with a question. Maybe not. Um, thank you. I'm going to turn this back over to Ariel to, uh, to wrap up. But uh, again, for those of you uh, listening on Zoom or Facebook Live, check this book out. It's great. And uh, thanks to Glenn and Kathy both for their scholarship and for taking time to talk to us tonight. Thank you. Ariel. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, again, on behalf of both the Reserve and Foundation, thank you for being here tonight, um, both to our speakers and to everybody in our audience. We've had over 100 people between Zoom and Facebook tuning in tonight, and we'll probably have many more as the recording goes out. So this will be available on Facebook as a recording. So if you had to miss any portion of it, don't worry. You can recap it later. Um, we will also be uh, sharing a copy of this as we do with all of our presentations uh, to YouTube in about a week, which is how long it takes us to download them. Again, this is part of an ongoing series. So tune in later uh, this month for the announcement of the rest of the uh, talks in our theme on conservation action and communities. 
And to everybody, I hope you have a safe and wonderful night. And we will see you all next time. Toodaloo. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.